there's probably no subject in gardening that's been written about so much as roses. And I'm guilty. I've written a couple of books about roses, about the old-fashioned ones. And whilst I was researching those roses, I became fascinated by rose oil and by rose water, and most especially by the healing aspects of it. And I've written a book which I believe to be unique on the subject, and it's going to be called The Healing Rose. And in the following film, which you'll see mostly shot in Turkey, I'm looking at some of the secrets of the extraction of this wonderful elixir. I'm John Scarman, and my love and my fascination of roses has brought me here to Turkey. And I'm here to find out how rose oil and how rose water is produced. What's fascinating for me is that at the time that this magnificent temple was full and when it was working, at that time rose water was an item of trade from this region. Civilizations seem to come and go, but the rose, in its simplest form, manages to endure. It may well be that down in the valleys there, the 30 petaled rose was being grown long before the Romans came. The 30 petaled rose of today is only just a fraction bigger than the one from the Roman times. But the rose itself could have come here with the movement of civilization even before the Romans. The reason why roses were grown here is because those wonderful fertile valleys down there have the absolutely ideal conditions for producing flowers of such excellence that the perfume can be distilled out of them. People often ask, what's the perfect climate in which to grow roses? Well, the answer really is the English summer's day, and that's what we have here. But it's not going to last. But then neither are these roses. These roses are going to flower for three, perhaps if they're very lucky, four weeks, and then they'll be over. By which time the temperature here will be up to 40 degrees, and it really won't be the ideal climate in which to grow roses. It's the altitude here, over a thousand meters, which produces the quality of light and the quality of flowers. And of course, it's also the surrounding climate. The mountains behind me tell us really that the cold air comes down from there and just improves the quality of these flowers with low night temperatures. In England we think roses need a heavy soil to grow well. Uh, clay is normally the ideal medium. But as you get hotter you actually need a lighter soil. And the soil here is ideal for roses in a very hot climate. At the moment it's an English summer's day, but in three weeks time the temperature will go up to 40 degrees. And that's when you need a light sandy soil like this. Um, and that will sit here and be the ideal medium. A heavy soil would probably crack and open and that would allow the plants actually to dry out. This is the boss and he's got one of these marvellous old baskets. Sadly, these old baskets are all being replaced by plastic bags today. Look at this lady, she's having such fun, she's talking and she's working at the same time. But what's brilliant is that she's using both hands. And that is the secret of getting all these roses picked as quickly as you can before the sun gets up. Okay, it's my turn to have a go now, and I'm going to try this two-handed system. It seems to me really quite good. The idea is that you put your hand on one, and your eye on the next one, and off you go as fast as you can. There we are. Lots of fun, you see. But I don't know if I'm really very good at talking at the same time as working. But off we go and... You can see the flowers. These flowers, yesterday, 
were in tight bud and they've opened overnight and you can see these are the ones that are being picked and what's being left behind are the roses like this one in tight bud and that will develop to this by tomorrow morning. This person is the fat lady and only a few years ago these were to be found in practically every village. Today, sadly, technology has taken over and the big stills have very largely forced these sort of village um, operations out of business. And what happens here is the same really as roses have been distilled for a thousand years. A simple fire is lit underneath and when the ashes have died down and it's not too hot the water is then introduced into the still. This one will take 45 litres of water and 15 kilos of rose petals. So it's a proportion of three to one. This will then be boiled very slowly um, and the fire kept down to the minimum. The concept of the fat lady with her quite wide bottom is that as the heat supplied the petals circulate around very lightly and gently in here and as they do the steam evaporates the essential oil. As the steam and the oil mix comes up together it then suddenly comes out into this large hat. And this is sealed of course here to prevent the air coming in. And this immediately takes the pressure off the steam so that it then literally trickles out as gently and slowly as possible down this pipe and the cold water condenses the steam and then that very slowly and gently trickles out as the finished rose water into the receiving vessel. This is the librarian who very kindly showed us his still and what he's got in his hand there is rose oil from last year's production and we can see if we turn it a little bit that it's actually congealed and it's just starting to melt a tiny bit now since he's brought it out into the sunlight. So what do you do with the spent petals? Well the answer here is absolutely as simple as anything. They come out of the still and they're put out here in the sun to dry and by the end of the summer these will be completely dry and then they'll be used in the house as winter fuel. Pure water is one of the main ingredients in distillation and one of the large factories we visited we estimated used 16 tons of it an hour and here it is it's wonderful as you can see it's crystal clear fresh water that's come down from the mountains and this must have contributed as one of the major reasons why the distillation of roses practically originated in this part of the world. Once the rose flowers are picked, the perfume remains in the flower. These were picked very early in the morning, but the perfume is still there. And these can be distilled at any time up until probably about midnight tonight. And you can see there's a lot of roses here to be processed in these wonderful copper stills. This is the second largest rose distillation factory in the world and it's an absolute joy to see that they're still using copper because this is so much kinder to the distillation process than stainless steel. It's pretty noisy and it's pretty hot but it does smell absolutely fantastic up here. So a quick clean out with the hose pipe and lots of water will now go in around about a ton. It's a fast turnaround time so what they want to do is to make sure to keep the thing going as fast as they can is to put the water in absolutely boiling. And they're going to fill this still right up to the very brim. Every flower has to count and there it is ready to get cooked and that will boil over, it takes an hour and then the water from that is kept and that will go to a second distillation process 
It's an absolutely marvellous array of different pipes and tanks and pumps, which really must bring great joy to the heart of a chemical engineer. But to us ordinary mortals, it's very difficult to comprehend what is actually going on in this position. So, how do you know when the distillation process is finished? Well, the answer is that when that water level reaches the red mark, then you've got your 500 litres boiled across. And this is the rose oil coming slowly to the surface of the separator. Wonderful. It's a brave man who opens up the top of one of those things. Okay, and right, here we go. Wow, that's all the slurry coming out of that. The slurry comes out into pits and then it's drawn up into this hopper and the water comes out of it and then the dried slurry is taken across by conveyor and comes out here and at the end of the distillation season, then this will all be collected and taken away and spread back on the fields. Well, talk about life being a bed of races. Just have a look at this. And as I'm standing here, I'm totally intoxicated by the perfume. What a super sight. Here we have a different process altogether. This is the process of producing the perfume by stripping it out using hexane. From there, it's further separated and comes down into a receiving vessel. The resulting mixture comes through into this tank here. We are really lucky to be shown this. This is actually kept under lock and key. And there, in the bottom of this still, is the finished concrete. We've had a marvellous time in Turkey. Wherever we've been, people have treated us with great kindness, great hospitality, and they've taken a lot of time and trouble to show us how the roses are farmed in the fields and how the perfume is coaxed out of them in the stills and in the factories. Uh, the climate here is beautiful and it's not surprising that the roses grow so well under these conditions. I'm here in Bath and the reason I've come here to Bath is to discover from my son John, who has the same name, how he uses both the rose oil and the rose water in the cosmetic preparations he makes under the name of Persian Rose. And what we will learn, I hope, is not only how to use the fragrance of the oils and waters, but also how the healing ability of the rose comes across in the cosmetic bases. As we saw in the film, there are two different ways of extracting rose water and rose oil. The first, as we saw, was by hydrodistillation, and the second is by solvent extraction. Now, both these different processes produce an entirely different rose water. And if you get the rose water wrong, then it will actually have no healing purposes at all. The first is the damask rose that is hydro distilled. And that's the one that has the healing properties, that has such a wonderful perfume and has so many different uses. The other is as a result of solvent extraction. And this is also called rose water. And it's very important that you actually read the ingredients on the back of the label when you buy it 
to make sure you get the right one because this, nice as it is, is actually only suitable for use with the ironing board. It has absolutely no virtue in the kitchen and none whatsoever when it comes to trying to heal abrasions on your skin or indeed for many other uses that rose water can have.